Good morning. And a very warm welcome to the worship of God, to those here in church, those watching and joining in online. A special welcome to visitors with us today. Um, it's good to have with us the Rainbows uh, from Durham, uh, Mark and Sarah, Annie, Grace, and Sam, uh, our niece and nephew, great niece, great nieces and great nephew. So welcome. Mark's a minister in Durham in a church plant there, uh, but he's on sabbatical at the moment, otherwise he may have been preaching. <laughs> so welcome. Tea and coffee through in the hall after the service as usual. Uh, do come and enjoy a time of fellowship together. This afternoon at three o'clock we have the discipleship explored up at um, Midshaw. Uh, when Joe will be leading us in a short series in Colossians. Everyone's welcome to that. If you need directions, speak to me or Joe. And Christians in sport, uh, quiz night, remember that, Friday 19th of May, 7.30 in the rugby club. A uh, great opportunity to invite people along or just go along yourself. So you could form teams or you'll be put into a team if you go yourself. But a great opportunity to take people along because it's a quiz for, for sports people of all uh, levels and uh, abilities, uh, but it is a sports quiz, so you need to have some involvement in sport for it really to work for you, or some knowledge of sport, and there's a, 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 a talk on the gospel at, at half time. So a great opportunity, do pray about that and go along and invite people if you can. Christian Aid Week begins today, and donation envelopes and devotionals are available at the door, and you can return the donation envelopes in the offering bowl in coming uh, Sundays. Next Sunday morning, services are at 9.45 here at TV at 11.15 at St. Mary's. Uh, I'll be at the General Assembly, so Ashley and the worship group will be leading us next week. Thank you, Ashley. So for a call to worship today, I'm going to read these words from Acts chapter 8. Uh, Philip and the Ethiopian official. So I'll just read these as our call to worship. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet speaking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Amen. So let's praise God together as we sing, In Christ Alone Our Hope Is Found.
Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, our Father, we bow before you together as we gather as your people in worship. We worship you as the one who has made all things. We see the beauty of the creation you have brought about all around us. We thank you for the life you have given us, this mysterious and wonderful gift. All this shows your nature, your power, your eternal nature and divine power. We worship you, our Creator. But we praise you supremely, Lord, today as we come for Jesus Christ, your Son, for what you have done in him. We have been singing of him. He alone is our hope. He is our all in all. You have given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in him. It is all ours. We receive them now. We will know them fully when we're with you in glory. But they are ours. No guilt in life, no fear in death. We have everything we need in Jesus Christ, your Son. We worship you. We thank you for his coming, his birth, his life, his teaching, his death for our sins, his resurrection, his ascension, his sending of the Holy Spirit his reigning at your right hand in the supreme place of power, and his certain coming again in glory. We worship you, that you've caught us up in him, in your love, choosing us by your amazing grace and love, saving us, keeping us as we have trusted in him. We are his, and he is ours. And we have that wonderful hope of being with you forever under the perfect rule of Christ, our King forever. So we come this morning, Lord, and we worship you. We ask your blessing on this time together in all its different aspects. May we meet with you as we worship you and praise you in our prayers, in the preaching and hearing of your word, in our prayers for others. Lord, Come and be with us, we ask. As we come, we ask that you will forgive us our sins as we confess them to you, our pride, our not hearing and listening to you, not obeying you, whatever it may be. Thank you that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, come and bless us, we pray. We cry out to you for that, and may it all be for your glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. We pray in Jesus' name, and continue in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This coming Thursday uh, is a very special day. Can someone tell me what day Thursday is? Just a wee test of the, your knowledge of the Christian calendar. Ascension Day. Forty days after the resurrection, Jesus had met, appeared to his disciples, and then he went up. He went back to his Father, and that's an amazing thing I shall be speaking about next Sunday. Ten days after that, what happened then? Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. The Lord sent the Holy Spirit in power on the waiting church who had been praying for that ten days. Down came the Spirit, and out they went in life and power, never to be the same again. The Thy Kingdom, the Thy Kingdom Come prayer initiative um, is focused on that ten-day period when the church was praying between the Ascension and Pentecost. 
The Archbishop of Canterbury brought that about a few years ago, and it's now spread to be a worldwide movement. We have joined in with it uh, uh, over the years here in Teviot in various ways, the special prayer meetings, prayer rooms, and so on. We're going to do something different this year, and we're going to do something different now. One of the focuses, foci, of uh, thy kingdom come is um, praying for people to come to know Jesus for themselves and trust in Him. So you were given when you came in the uh, lovely prayer journal, and inside it there are five strips of card. You should also have or have access to a pen. What we're going to do now in an interactive thing involved together, but individual first and then together as a church, I want you to think of five people who aren't involved in church who are not following Jesus. Think of their names. Limit it to five. No more than five. It doesn't have to be five. F people in your family, among your friends, school at work, um, colleagues, neighbors, people you come into contact with in your life. Think of them. Who do you want to pray to come to know Jesus for themselves? And then write the name of one person on each of these cards. I'll give you time to do that. And then uh, we're going to link them together into a chain. And in good Blue Peter fashion, here's one prepared earlier. Um, there's one end of each of the strips. Thank you. <laughs> one end of each of the strips has got a sticky bit. Lick and stick, or spit and stick, whatever you want to do. But join them together as a chain. However, as Joe was saying, this is much more complicated to explain than it, it should actually be given what we're actually doing. But leave the fifth one open, because then we're going to shuffle along and link our chains with those around us. So is, is that clear? Clear enough? Joe and Sheila and others will be around to help if necessary. But let's just take a, a, take a moment or two, think about these people, write their names in the strip, then join your links together, but leave the fifth one open, <laughs> and then I'll tell you what to do. Anybody else not got one? Can you put your hand up if you've not got one? You've got to get the right end to get it to stick. Right, how are we getting on? What I'd like to do, can you turn, turn round once you've finished your chain and link your chain up with the open link to... Um, your neighbours. <laughs> how do you do that? Is, is, is that, that work? Ah, it's not, it's not perfect, is it? No, it's not. You shouldn't have to do that. You should, that's it, yeah. That seems a funny one. That's it, yeah. 
what else? Just. Oh. I'll do, give it back to me. Give it to me. Mm. You've got to get the right. Mm, it's both, been like the I know because I, I, th I thought it was okay. What is it? Here's mine. Here's another one. Well, I think I think you should just. Um, right, what Sheila's going to do now is come along at the end and collect all your chains and take them away. That's fine. Plenty of time. Yes, yeah, Sheila will collect the pens and your chains. Then Annie and Grace are going to go and help Sheila during the service, put them all together, and they will then come back at the end of this, later on in the service, the chains will come back as one giant church chain with all these names on it. Sometimes they don't stick, very, some of them are not sticking very well. Can you add that one into the, put that one into the box? Somebody's done that one separately. There seems to be variable stickiness. Um, do what you can. Sh Sheila will, Sheila will sort it out if you, don't worry if you're, some of your chains aren't sticking, Sheila will sort it out later on through in the hall. Can you add that one in? That's a. Well, you might need to add that. Let's just take. We'll do, do it through the two by. How are you doing, Bill? <laughs> Variable stickiness. <laughs> Variable stickiness. That's good. <laughs> Joe and mm, Kathy. <laughs> Are you alright? You can't know. <laughs> we've got a song and then we've got the reading. <laughs> I think this was a good idea, taking it out. see you later. <laughs> so each of us has put five names in these cards. They're going to be joined up into a giant chain with all the names of all the we're praying for, which makes it a church thing together, which that was a very good way of entering into the spirit of the Thy Kingdom Come. Uh, and we'll pray. We'll not pray specifically for the individual people. We'll pray for the, all the names when they come back in again later in the service.
We're going to have a song now. Just remain seated. You can join in if you like, but it came out during um, lockdown. We seek your kingdom. Uh, and I thought we'd bring it back out again for today. Uh, it was the Thy Kingdom Come video.
Ian's going to come and uh, read our Bible passage for us now. Thanks, Ian. Today's reading is the last few verses of Isaiah chapter 52 and the whole of chapter 53, which can be found on page 741 in the Pew Bible. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told they will see and what they have not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. Thank you, Ian. We're going to sing now, following on from that, about the sufferings of Christ. O sacred head, sore wounded, we'll stand to sing.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord God, our Father, we are so thankful for your deep, deep love in Jesus for us. Lord Jesus, for all you went through for us, we thank you from the depths of our hearts. What language shall we borrow? How can we find the words and the response to the depths of your love? We lay ourselves down before you in thankfulness to live for you and serve you and love you. Until the day Jesus comes back or we go to be with him, when we will be with him forever with nothing to mar that perfect worship and fellowship and service with you. Father, out of that place of grace in which we stand in Jesus Christ, your Son, we come with our prayers. We think of this world and all its need. So very many places we could pray for, Father. But we pray for Sudan and the conflict there. Please raise up effective peacemakers so that there may be strenuous efforts for peace and reconciliation. We pray for Ukraine as we hear of counterattacks and so on. Lord, please may a just peace settlement be sought and found. Prince of Peace, please bring peace. Let me think of Turkey today with the general election there following the earthquakes. Turkey and Syria a few months back. We pray for that really important election for the right outcome in accordance with your will, for the sake of your people, for the sake of your church there. We pray, pray Father, for the work of relief agencies throughout the world who work hard to alleviate suffering. Uh, we pray especially for those who do so in the name of Jesus. And we pray for Christian aid at the start of this Christian aid week. May you direct them in their work of practical care and compassion in Jesus' name. And may they have the resources they need to carry out their work. May there be a generous outpouring of giving in this week. Lord, we ask your hand to be on the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, which begins on Saturday. In all that is discussed, may all commissioners seek your mind, your will, in accordance with your word, directed by your Spirit. As the church acknowledges your Son as its only King and Head, may that be so in reality for this assembly in all its debating and decision-making. Save us, Lord, from going down paths that displease you or going further down paths that displease you in your grace. Sovereign Lord, may your purposes for your church and for this nation prevail. Gracious Sovereign Lord, we cry for this. Pray for reformation and renewal in your church. And we think of the Church of England and the Anglican Communion in the turmoil it finds itself in following the recent decision regarding the blessing of same-sex marriage. Lord, may your truth reign in all this and all that happens in consequence resulting from it. For the sake of your gospel, for the sake of your church, for the sake of your glory and your truth and your grace, may the outcome be pleasing to you. Lord, have mercy on your people. Father, we bring before you those who mourn the death of a loved one. May they know your comfort and the hope of the gospel. And we bring before you those who need our prayers, those who are unwell, those who are struggling, those who are in care homes, sheltered housing, those who know their time on earth is short. Whatever their situation, Lord, in your power and love, come to them and meet them at the point of their need, we pray, giving your perfectly sufficient grace, strength, and courage. We name before you those we are thinking about just now.
We think today of Michael Aitken, well known in the town, who had a fall at work on Thursday and is seriously injured in hospital. We pray for your healing hand on Michael and that he will look to you in his extremity. Trust you. Be with him and his family. For him and for everyone we have prayed for, please look with compassion on them, Lord. Now in a moment of quiet, we bring our personal concerns to you. Lord God, our Father, please hear all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, as we bring them in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we come to God's Word, let's sing Meekness and Majesty.
Short prayer, Lord Jesus, as we come to this passage now, may we see you as our God, the man who is God. Bless your word to our hearts now deeply, we pray. Amen. So in our journey through Isaiah, we come to this glorious passage, chapter 52, 13 to 53, 12, known as the fourth servant song. We had the first servant song, Sarah preached in it a few weeks back. That was chapter 42, 1 to 9, and the second one is in 49, 1 to 13, the third one in 50, 4 to 11, and this is the grandest of them all. We heard last Sunday about the, this man Cyrus, this King Cyrus of Media Persia, who was going to come and be the one who would bring God's people back from exile. They weren't in exile yet. They were going into exile, people of Judah, and then they were going to come back. And it was Cyrus who was going to cause that to happen as God's agent. And God called Cyrus his Messiah, his anointed one. Remarkable, this pagan king. But we've been seeing all through Isaiah that there is a, a greater forward look towards the Messiah, the anointed one, the servant who's coming. Israel had failed to be the servant God intended her to be, failing to love him, obey him, turning away from him. They weren't the light to the nations that they were supposed to be, but the servant was coming, perfect servant who will bring about God's purposes of worldwide redemption, and we see that so wonderfully. The whole root of it, the basis of it foretold in our reading this morning. Every verse in chapter 53 is quoted in the New Testament except verse 10, and it's still influential. Uh, the passages according to Peter White quoted 41 times in the New Testament. Another writer I read said that it was quoted or alluded to about 84 times. I haven't, didn't have time to check it, uh, but we get the message. This is a hugely significant passage for the message of Christ and the gospel, our understanding of that. I heard a while ago of a Christian who was speaking to a Jewish person about Jesus. And uh, in the course of that, he read Isaiah 53. The Jewish person was, for whatever reason, not familiar with Isaiah 53, whether it's not read in the synagogue or whatever, I'm not sure. Uh, but his response to this Christian reading Isaiah 53 was this, why are you reading from the New Testament? And it's, when you read that, it's just amazing, isn't it? The description here, no wonder Isaiah has been described as a gospel in the Old Testament even the fifth gospel. Before we come to the passage, we had as our call to worship um, part of that tremendous, lovely encounter between Philip and the Ethiopian official who was traveling back from Jerusalem uh, to Ethiopia, slightly different location than it is now in his chariot, and he was reading, uh, and the Holy Spirit told Philip to go up to the chariot, and he heard him. What was he reading? Isaiah 53. How providential. He asked him, uh, Philip asked him a great evangelist question. Do you understand what you're reading? How can I unless someone explains it to him? So up, he's invited up into the chariot, and then uh, uh, the official asks a fantastic question. Uh, who is Isaiah speaking about here? That gets to the heart of, doesn't he, himself or someone else? And then Philip, and I love what Ronald Dunn, the late uh, American preacher, says about this. He'd, he didn't start to explain to the uh, Ethiopian official about whether there was two or three Isaiahs or uh, all the different possibilities of who the servant might be. He simply, what did he do? In the AV version, preached unto him Jesus. Beginning with that passage, he told him the good news about Jesus. And that's what we're going to look at this morning as we go through this passage. There's five stanzas. It's carefully constructed. Five stanzas, beginning with that last part of chapter 52. Each of three verses, which take us through the career of Jesus. And the key one is the middle one. 
which we'll come to. So first, this one being foretold here, the servant, he will suffer on the way to glory. The song begins and ends with the victory of the servant. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, page 741 in the Pew Bible, verse 13 of chapter 52. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And then right at the end, 53 verse 12, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. This servant is going to be victorious. And how appropriate he will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted is as we come to Ascension Day on Thursday when Jesus went back, ascended to that place of power at the right hand of the Father. But this victory is going to come at tremendous cost and great suffering. The servant's road to glory is marked with suffering, and of course, so is ours in him. But this, this, this road is marked with suffering. In each of the servant songs, suffering has been there, very faintly in the first one, and then increasing in intensity, through to such depth of awful reality of suffering in this servant song. Verse 14, many will be appalled at him. Many comes again and again in this chapter, this, this passage. Here, many are appalled at him. Why are they appalled? Because of how the servant looked. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Alec Matthias says they looked at him, and they didn't just say, is this him? Is this he? They said, is this human? Isn't that awful? The, the, we had it in the hymn there before the prayer. How does that visage language, languish, which one shone with glory? He is so disfigured that he's hardly recognizable as himself, not just as himself, but as a human being. So mar marred was, a, his, was his appearance, so broken his body, so damaged by all he'd gone through. When we see a loved one disfigured through illness or accident, remember Jesus. But just as there were many who were appalled, this is a kind of summary introduction we bit this, this first stanza. Just as there were many who were appalled, there will be many who will be astonished, so he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. He will sprinkle many nations. So there's a sacrificial, a sacrificial imagery there. Um, in the sacrifices in the Old Testament, blood was often taken and sprinkled on the altar or on the robes of the priest or uh, on someone or on a house if it had uh, mildew and that kind of stuff on the holy place to cleanse it from defilement and sin. So he's going to sprinkle many nations. This is a grand sacrificial thought, isn't it? Looking ahead to what the gospel will do as people trust in Jesus and folk all over the world find cleansing and new life in Jesus. He will sprinkle many nations. And then kings and rulers will be reduced to silence before this king of kings either when trusting in him themselves or when he returns. He will suffer on the way to glory. Next. He will be despised and rejected. We're looking in this stanza, chapter 53, verses 1 to 3, at the life of Jesus. He's a child becoming a man, a tender shoot growing up. He's a human among humans. There's nothing particularly special about him to look at in human terms. He has no beauty or majesty or magnetic personality in himself as such. But he grew up before him, before God. He was a tender shoot. There's life there. There's not life of God in him. 
he's like a root out of dry ground. The context is barren and dry, but he comes as the one who has this life in himself. He's different, but it takes revelation to see who he is. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, says Isaiah, verse 1, 53. Faith and revelation are closely linked. To see that this one who's come is, in fact, God come as a man, as one of us, it requires our spiritual eyes to be opened. It requires revelation to see. Um, I remember being a sermon once with a friend, and it was a fantastic gospel sermon. And he said to me afterwards, how could anyone not come under conviction of sin as a result of that preaching? And of course, people can sit under the Word of God and be completely unmoved because their eyes are closed, hearts are blinded. The Holy Spirit needs to come to open our eyes spiritually to see and to believe faith and revelation are closely linked. Otherwise, we'll just see Jesus, remember someone, a phrase someone used, as a bloke in a cloth cap, as a good man perhaps, but nothing more. We will disregard him ultimately and indeed reject him. For what happened to Jesus? Isaiah tells us clearly he was despised and rejected. We held him in low esteem, end of verse 3. Esteem is an accounting word. He was counted up, added up, and it was decided that he came to nothing. No value. The man who was God. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. He knew pain, physical, emotional, spiritual. What a picture this is. As someone knows a friend, he was familiar with grief. Suffering was his companion as a result of this rejection. This is our God. Strange, isn't it? You will be despised and rejected. How sad. How are you today with Jesus? It's worth asking, us, asking at this point. How are you with him? Who is he to you? Do you see him as the one he is? Do you welcome him and worship him? Does he reign in you above everything else as your Savior and God? He will suffer on the way to glory. He will be despised and rejected. Then we come to the heart of this passage. And as you can see, it's the heart. It's the middle of these five stanzas, right in the heart here. That often happens in uh, Hebrew literature, the scriptures, the Old Testament. There is this structure that points to the key meaning of what it's all about, and it's right in the middle. He will take the punishment due for our sins, verses 4 to 6. What a picture we have in verse 4. He took up our pain. The infirmity, the suffering and damage that sinfulness that going against God's way causes, he took that up. He bore our suffering, the sorrow, the blight that comes in our lives as a result of sin. He bore it. Alec Mateer helpfully points out that our total redemption, body as well as soul, comes from Jesus and his work on the cross. In the new heaven and the new earth, sickness will be as completely banished as well as will sin through what Jesus did on the cross. So when Jesus healed people, and when people are healed in answer to our prayers now, that is Jesus at work, giving a foretaste of that coming completeness when there'll be no more sin, death, pain, sickness, and all the rest of it. Jesus takes up, the servant takes up our pain. He lifts the burden from us. That's the image of He lifts it off us. He uh, carries our suffering. He shoulders it. He puts a heavy load on his shoulders so it's off ours. And Isaiah's picking up the image of the scapegoat here in Leviticus 16. Uh, on the Day of Atonement, two goats were chosen. The first one was sacrificed for sin. 
The other one, the priest laid his hands on its head and laid on the head of that goat his own sins and all the sins of the community, and it was sent out into a remote place. It's a sign, picture, foretaste of what Jesus is going to do when he died on the cross. Carrying our sins. And it could easily be misunderstood. We can see that, that, um, well, he must be dying here for um, something he's done wrong himself. We consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. It's God's doing this to him because of something wrong that he has done in himself. But of course, that is not so. He was pierced, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Note the word for. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He is doing that in our place. It is substitutionary atonement, to use the word that's used, which sounds complicated, but it's really saying He is our substitute, stands in our place, and dies the death that we should die for our sins, and bears the judgment of God on that so that we can go free. He takes our transgressions, our willful rebellions. He takes our iniquities, the bentness at the heart of our sinful nature, and He dies for it and deals with it once and for all. He deals with the, the root of all the problems of this fallen and broken world, sin. And it's really severe what happens to him. He was pierced. He was crushed. Think of the nails piercing his precious hands and feet. Think of the crown of thorns pulled down on his head so that it penetrated. Thorns penetrated his scalp. He was crushed. That's cruel agonies ending in death. He took all that. That's what Jesus went through for us. And this is at the center of what this servant, this suffering servant will do. It brings peace. It brings healing. Oh, the depth of the love and wisdom of God. Do you see it? Do you see how wonderfully good God is? Jesus is. Our sins, if not dealt with, will bring punishment. But the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. There's an abrupt change in focus in verse 6 from he to we, and it brings out just how sinful we are, our neglect and sin and willful turning from God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. All have sinned, Paul says in Romans. Each of us has turned to their own way. So together and individually, we have turned from God and we're culpable before Him. Driving down the A7 last week, South, a lot of lambs in the fields this year. Uh, and when they're very wee, they're too timid to do very much, but they get to a certain stage when they're still young and adventurous and they are still small enough to get through the fence. So how often you see a lamb, what do you do about it? Well, tell the farmer if you can. There's uh, the lamb at the side has escaped. It has gone astray. Uh, it has, oh, I suppose, willfully and deliberately, yes. It gone out where it shouldn't be, and you see the anxious you staring through the fence <laughs> for it to come back. Hopefully, it'll get back through where it went out. They often can't find the way in that they went out. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to their own way. Handel uses this passage extensively in the Messiah, if you know it. Um, and there's a chorus, all we like sheep, all we like sheep. And it's dancey and cheery and uh, in its rhythm and style. How odd, all we like sheep. Why is he doing that? Because that's exactly what we're like. We sin lightly and high-handedly. 
Oh, we like sheep have gone astray, etc. And then it comes to the middle of the chorus, and the mood totally changes to dark, heavy harmonies. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And it, the harmonies go, He has laid on him. He has laid on him. He has laid on him the iniquities of us all. Placed on the head of this perfect Lamb all the sins of all those that the Lord is going to save on him. All the heaviness of our sinfulness on his head. Wonderful. Oh, terrible. For, isn't it a strange thing that the awfulness of that is our salvation, that the Lord's glory is supremely seen in the depth of the suffering of the cross, right at the heart of this passage. Who does this laying? No doubt about it. God has laid in Him the iniquity of us all. Later on we have, it was the Lord's will to crush Him and cause Him to suffer. That is deep the deep heart of that love of Father and Son and Holy Spirit together, willingly doing that. We need to move on, but do note that this, really important that we grasp this and hold on to it as Christians in these days and all days that the substitutionary atonement is at the heart of the Christian faith. There are those who deny it, can't deny it from this passage or anywhere else. Jesus died for our sins in our place. Moving on to the next stanza, he will accept unjust execution without complaint. More briefly, 53, 79. When you see sheep penned up about to be sheared, um, they look anxious, don't they? Uh, they don't really know what's going on, and so too lambs going to the slaughter. They go meekly, not really knowing what faces them. But this lamb, Jesus, had full knowledge of what was going to happen to him, and yet willingly went to suffering. Think of the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will but yours be done. Take this cup away from me, Lord, but not your will, not my will but yours be done. And he went willingly uh, to be led through a mockery of a trial, through a miscarriage of justice to the cross, knowingly, willingly, silently, and meekly. The innocent one chose to become a victim, to take our sins away. And then the last stanza, long life and joy will follow. 53, 10 to 12. Gloriously, it's not the end for the servant. Uh, he is brought through it. Listen to the end of verse 10. He will see his offspring and prolong his days. He had no offspring of his own, humanly speaking, but he will have a myriad of spiritual offspring as a result of what he's done, those who come to faith in him. And the will of the Lord will prosper on his hand. He succeeded in what he came to do. It is finished, he cried out on the cross. This is no defeat, it is victory. In verse 11, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. He goes down into life, but he's raised down to death. He's raised to life again. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted as we started. Jesus is satisfied by what he's done. The Lord is satisfied. Wonderful benefits flow to his people. It says at the end he will um, give a portion, portion among the great. It's better bet, give a portion among the many. It ties in with the use of that. Uh, and he will divide the spoils with the great. It can be numerous. He will share the benefits of what he's achieved with those who come to belong to him. Forgiveness, righteousness, peace, joy, eternal life, 
every spiritual blessing shared with those who become His. But it's not automatic. Just two pictures here. As we draw towards the end, it's really important we look, what's our response to this? Because there could be those who might say, well, Jesus has done this, therefore automatically, just because He has died and risen again, I can just go on and do whatever I want in my life and disregard Him, and I will be saved in the, the heresy of universalism. It is not so. In two ways that's brought out here in this passage. Verse 10 speaks of the life of a servant being made an offering for sin. You will make him, his, his soul, his life, a guilt offering. It's translated sin, an offering for sin in the new NIV. The NIV uses God there, but there is, it doesn't say God. It says you will make his life a guilt offering. Therefore, in the ambiguities, deliberate ambiguities, I believe, that Isaiah has, it brings nuance and shading of meaning because it could be God making the um, servant's life a guilt offering. Yes, that's true, he did. He gives his son as a sacrifice of sin. It could be the servant himself giving his life as a sacrifice for sin. Yes, that's true, he did. But it also, and this is where our response come in, comes in, it could be us making his life a guilt offering. In the sense, not that we make the offering, but we make that offering our own. Think of that goat, uh, the sins laid on it as the priest laid his hands on its head. We are to take Jesus as our Savior and make him our guilt offering, and our, our sins are to be laid on him. We have to trust in him for ourselves as our Savior who died for us on the cross. There's another way that our response is brought out. That is where it says, by his knowledge, he will justify, my righteous servant will justify many, verse 11. By his knowledge. Um, we need to know him for ourselves. And as we're united to faith by him, as we trust in him, what he knows, what he experiences, what he has gone through becomes ours and we are made right with God by knowledge of Him, by His knowledge, by knowing what He's gone through, by experiencing it, but not ourselves. He experienced it for us, and that becomes our experience. We need to respond in faith to Jesus. So, that's enough for today, and time is moving on, I see as well. So, he will suffer on the way to glory. He will be despised and rejected. He will take the punishment due for our sins. He will accept unjust execution without complaint and long life and joy for him and for all who trust in him will follow. Thanks be to God for saving us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can you bring them in, Joe? We'll just bring in the big chain, then we'll have a prayer and our final Let's, let's have a prayer as we're waiting, and the chain can be brought in during the prayer. That's fine. Lord God, our Father, we worship You. We give You thanks and praise for the depths of what we've been looking at today, for Jesus, for His death in our place to save us, taking 
that place for us and being for us, what we could never, ever do for ourselves, saving us in Your mercy and grace. Thank You, Lord, and that every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. Thank You, Lord. We pray for those whose names are written on our big church prayer chain. As these are brought in, Lord, we pray that by Your grace You will bring those whose names we have written on these chains to trust in Jesus for themselves. Hear our hearts cry for these people whom we love, and we long for them to know You and Your salvation and the blessings You bring. Lord, hear all our prayers as we dedicate ourselves to You as well in response to all we've heard to live for You and serve You and love You forever. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Grace Annie and Sam, Shula and Joe, for all you've done. So let's close our service by singing how deep the Father's love for us stand to sing.
to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Let's say the grace together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.